Hello everyone. Uh, good day, good evening, or very good morning for those joining us. Uh, I'm Valmiki Mukherjee, Chairman and Founder of Cyber Future Foundation, and it's my privilege to be on another uh, really great panel and session uh, on the Global Horasis Meeting for 2022. Uh, it's uh, it's incredibly interesting times we lead in. I was just on the other session. Uh, on the plenary session about the global economic outlook. And uh, I think nobody can fail to notice the perfect storm that we live in, uh, and so many ways, both physical and cyber. Well, uh, some of us here have a little bit of deeper view of cyber, uh, but we are trying to get that out to the world and share with the rest of the, uh, with the rest of the, uh, you know, the community, of, of leaders, of, of uh, industry leaders, for of people. And uh, we want to make sure that we give you a full perspective of the uh, of the situation. So today, uh, we're going to talk about uh, eradicating or at least minimizing cyber crime. Uh, this, this could have been a very bold topic and bolder how you could eradicate uh, cyber crime. And I think we should get there. But let's start with at least minimizing because it's spiraling out of control. And I'm joined by uh, my distinguished colleagues here, Gustavo Gori, and my dear friend Andrea Bonimblanc. Uh, and uh, as the speakers join, we'll get them introduced. But uh, to set the stage, this is a situation uh, that we live in today. That our data and our uh, our information, uh, both public, personal, uh, you know, organizational, uh, and and the government, one way or the other, this goes into uh, outlining a, a plethora of of different areas and, ex and uh, where our information is getting out and it's leaking, right? So we'll we'll take uh, a a series of uh, conversations in terms of looking at this as to what's the physical versus logical uh, and cyber implication of this. How can policy play a part of this, and how can we go and uh, and address the challenges of um, of making it real, get minimizing cyber crime, and this involves leaders educating the leaders and making sure everybody's in line uh, with getting us on board with that. With that, let me uh, hand it over to Andrea, um, and you can. I'm just going by the, the way I'm seeing the screen. So, um, Andrea, if you go next, and then we'll go. Boaz, great to see you. Have you here? And then to Gustavo. Great, thank you so much, Valmiki, <clears throat> and really great to be here with uh, this really uh, distinguished group of people with very diverse and uh, deep experience in not only cyber, but uh, business and uh, organizational resilience and, and a bunch of other things. Um, I'll just uh, talk a little bit about my perspective or where I come from on this topic, because I think it's always useful uh, in a conversation and uh, in a presentation to um, share with you uh, my journey to why I work with boards and, and have the perspective that I do on cyber resilience and cyber risk oversight. Um, so my background, uh, I spent a bunch of years in uh, four companies as a general counsel, chief risk, ethics compliance officer. And in my last company, I was given responsibility for overseeing uh, cybersecurity. Uh, it was a technology company, uh, very div diversified and globalized and uh, with different sort of needs in terms of cybersecurity. Um, and it was uh, in need of someone to be their CISO, I suppose, Chief Information Security Officer. There was someone who was doing the work but was not integrated properly with the rest of the organization. Um, and so that uh, particular experience was very uh, dramatic for me because I had never looked at cyber before. This is about 12 years ago now. Um, and I didn't have the technology and IT and, and information security expertise, but I had a, a sense for it. So after about six months of doing that work together, I had a big aha moment, which was that in order for any organization, this was a diversified global company, uh, to have a sound cybersecurity uh, program and system. Uh, you needed to have what I call the triangular cyber governance um, uh, sort of structure. And the triangular structure really meant that three really important pieces needed to be well integrated with each other. 
uh, there had to be the development of a cybersecurity philosophy or governance approach uh, on the part of the executive team in the sense that the management really knows how to uh, deal with the overall operations of the organization. So management is responsible for developing what I called uh, cyber uh, governance philosophy, if you want to call it that, but it's really practical. Um, but then that's one piece. So that's kind of the strategy piece, the execution piece. Above that, you needed to have a board of directors that was really uh, prepared and, and uh, uh, educated on the topic of cyber governance and cyber risk oversight. And certainly 12 years ago, that wasn't the case. And it continues to be a big challenge in a lot of boardrooms. Um, you don't have necessarily the right kinds of people uh, in the board of directors uh, who have experience with technology, with cyber, with uh, digital transformation. And so that um, lack of expertise or at least um, experience in some of these areas can be a real drawback in today's world where cyber attacks are, uh, you know, everywhere uh, and digital transformation is everywhere. So and those things are very interrelated as well. Um, so the, the first piece was the executive group having to um, develop that cyber risk, cyber resilience philosophy or strategy. The second piece is having the proper kind of board oversight, which means proper reporting, proper um, information flows, um, being proactive about uh, the, the oversight, not just sitting back and listening to reports. Um, and then the third piece, and this is where the real sort of tactical operational stuff goes on. Uh, the third part of that triangle was cross-functional collaboration and integration between the functions that are necessary to look at cyber, as well as the operational pieces of the business. Um, and so when you don't have the, the chief information security officer team and the chief risk officer team and the legal team and the financial team, working seamlessly together to look at their particular cyber risk profile and cyber uh, vulnerabilities. Um, when you don't have that, you have serious problems in your organization. Uh, another important piece of that is, of course, the preparation of cyber resilience, which is having the crisis management preparedness plan uh, focused on the cyber issues that can happen to your footprint as an organization. Um, and then uh, also making sure that if you're a diversified, decentralized or multi sort of subsidiary company, that you have people in each of those operational units that works seamlessly and closely with that cross-functional team. So there's a lot of that sort of uh, integration that needs to take place at the front lines in the tactical area. There has to be that strategy from the business uh, leaders that is well-informed and responsive to the footprint, the business, the products, the services, the people that are in that organization. And then there has to be that proper oversight coming from, uh, from the board. And the proper oversight, uh, frankly, requires savvy people, um, you know, maybe retired CISOs or uh, other people who have been very deeply involved with technology and understand cyber. Uh, or chief risk officers, compliance people who have dealt with these topics. Uh, you want to have those kinds of people on your board, um, on helping the board see the way. Um, but much more than that, you need to have uh, the likes of, of Boaz and, and his team reporting into the board on a regular basis, uh, telling them the most important things they need to know about their company and their vulnerabilities. Um, and then the last thing I, I'd say, um, and you know, if you want me to say more, I'll say more. But the last thing I'll say is a lot of what I do uh, is obviously from the perspective of how do you create the resilience and the risk oversight from the inside looking out, right? Um, this is a very interactive thing. This is a, um, you know, we're living right now in this uh, new situation with the Ukraine war where the whole cyber piece has changed very dramatically. Uh, I saw a headline just this morning. I haven't read the piece yet that since the Ukraine war started, ransomware attacks have declined substantially, which is, you know, you could say correlated or cause, uh, causational, I don't know, but there's obviously some uh, issues there, right? Um, and companies need to be attuned to what's going on right now rather than last year. And so uh, I co-wrote a piece with a friend and colleague of mine, the CEO of WireX Systems, who's uh, his name is Tomer Saban, and we just published a piece last week 
um, on how this Ukraine war has sort of thrown a monkey wrench into uh, cyber preparedness because things have been changing uh, very dramatically quickly. Um, and what that underscores for me more than anything else is some of the things that I just shared with you about this triangular approach to cyber risk governance. And that means the CISO uh, and his or her team really need to be in the CEO's office much more often. Um, and maybe also with the chief risk officer and a couple of other people who have a piece of this puzzle. Um, the board has to be much more engaged than before because there may be specific vulnerabilities that they need to be aware of and, and be part of overseeing. Um, and I think the tools and, and the techniques used on the front lines also have to be constantly reviewed and revised uh, by that frontline group of people who, who are implementing the policy. So I'll stop there. Uh, so everybody else has a word, uh, has a chance to put in a word <laughs> and I'll uh, I look forward to the conversation. We can't hear you. Uh, thank you, Andrea. And uh, this probably tees off right off to to the role that Boaz has uh, played in several, uh, you know, in his role now in previous roles with other organizations, and bring on that that uh, the triangular uh, approach uh, and uh, perspectives to it. So, Boaz, I'll over to you, sir, for uh, for a little bit of intro background and your perspectives. Uh, sure. Uh, great to uh, great to be here, and thanks, Val, for having me again. It's, uh, it's uh, good to good to see you. Um, you know, this this topic is one that's um, that's so broad and, and, and so front and center, as uh, Andrea was mentioning, in terms of just what what boards are focused on, what what organizations are focused on. Um, you know, in terms of my own background, um, I'm the chief security officer at uh, Akamai. Um, Akamai Technologies is a company that um, delivers um, has a delivery security and compute uh, in terms of uh, powering and protecting life online. We, we carry a substantial portion of the uh, internet's overall web traffic um, and uh, have been doing that really since the, the early days of the internet. Um, so, so we're certainly very much uh, focused on how do we protect ourselves, how do we protect our, our customers? And I lead the security team that drives our, um, our internal uh, security. Uh, I've had a number of CISO roles in the past uh, as well uh, and started out life in the, um, uh, you know, as an individual contributor in the, in the technology space. Um, and, you know, when I, when I started my career, it was uh, over at uh, one of the large telcos in Europe. Uh, and at the time, you know, our, I was in the, uh, helping them uh, develop uh, security systems for mobile phones. And, and one of the big concerns, and I would say one of the primary concerns, was people who, for example, would load phone cards and grant themselves more value. So you'd buy a phone, call, you know, phone card that was worth uh, $10, uh, you know, $10, and you would load extra money, and then you'd have $100, and this would cause a loss for the, for the telco. And if we think back at that kind of risk level, it's a pretty minor concern compared to what we what we face today. I mean, today we have a level of interconnectedness that creates risks that are just orders of magnitude greater than the kind of limited financial risks that existed, say, say 20 years ago. Um, you know, I mean, personally, I find that uh, a really fascinating space. So I, I feel fortunate that I sort of landed in this uh, very interesting, uh, very interesting industry. But I do think that we're we're in a very vulnerable time as a, as a society that. You know, as Andrea was alluding to, it, it's really a broad coalition of, of, of stakeholders that are, um, are needed in order to, to really improve our, our posture and our capabilities in that space. And from a cybercrime perspective, if I think on the macro level, there's, there's really three trends over the last couple of years that have fueled or, or enabled the increase in, in cybercrime. Uh, one of them is just the, the existence of digital money and the, and the ability to transfer funds in a sort of what is at least in theory a anonymous manner that can't be traced or at least can't be practically traced in, in many cases. And so that ability to transfer money in a way that would have been unthinkable, uh, you know, several decades ago or even several years ago uh, is, is one of the things that's really driven certainly the, the, the rise of ransomware as well as other, other forms of cybercrime. Uh, the other is a issue that's existed for a long time, which is the jurisdictional issue where there's jurisdictions within which one can commit crimes and face at least, you know, very limited probability of, of repercussions uh, on, on a practical level. <clears throat> so from a risk reward ratio, that sort of augurs in favor of, uh, of the, the cyber criminal. And then third, 
and this is really the, the the new or unique element within cybercrime is the vulnerabilities within within our systems. And we've seen, you know, just the sheer number of vulnerabilities that are exploitable. Uh, the avenues of those vulnerabilities uh, increase from from year to year, uh, and that really offers just a, a myriad of options for somebody who's looking at how do they uh, achieve a particular aim, whether it's financial or otherwise, with, within a, a, a cybercrime context. Um, and if you think of the that, that third piece and how we're able to address it, I, I think that in some ways we're sort of regressing backwards because the, the number of uh, CVEs or vulnerabilities that are published on a, on a yearly basis, you know, into the, into the many thousands, uh, organizations have many different points of connection between their systems. So if you think about the number of vendors, for example, that an organization uses, that's been increasing both numerically and in terms of the complexity there. Um, and then there's a complex software supply chain, for example, we have organizations, you know, almost any company just uses so many different kinds of systems. So that, that problem has certainly gotten a lot more complicated. And you, you just need to look at the headlines to see, uh, you know, the, the many different kinds of, uh, uh, I don't want to call it innovative, but, but innovative methods that cyber criminals are, are using. Um, and in many cases, the technology is there to secure things, but the level of complexity is such that the average user doesn't have the time, the resources, the expertise in order to leverage those technologies in a way that would uh, that would adequately protect them. Uh, you, you may have seen in the news, uh, you know, there's a, a, an actor this week who had some of their uh, NFTs stolen worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. I think it was Seth Green. Um, you know, it's the uh, Board Ape Yacht Club uh, NFTs, which are, you know, go for at least... Uh, you know, at least until very recently, we're, we're, we're very expensive. And, and as we've seen in the last couple of weeks, um, you know, there's been a downturn in the uh, uh, in the overall kind of crypto market. Um, but the interesting thing there is that you have a large number of people who have what amounts to trillions of dollars in assets that are really held just on the basis of what boils down to knowledge of a certain number. Like if you have that number, you have the access. If you, if you kind of abstract everything away, um, and it's really, really hard to create systems in which that can't be abused to, to, to kind of get a hold of that number and then, uh, you know, monetize that situation. And, and the, the amounts are so huge. Uh, and even with the recent downturn in crypto, just the, the vast sort of size of the, the digital asset market is such that it's going to attract a lot of these, uh, you know, a lot of these cyber criminals to it. Now, on the flip side of it, the, uh, the advantage that, um, that digital defenders have and that organizations have is that there's just a vast amount of data out there that can be used in order to um, to identify and, and, and to protect organizations. Um, you know, there was a very interesting um, law form article in Wired a couple of weeks ago around uh, how law enforcement has been using the sort of de-anonymizing aspects of, um, of blockchain and crypto to uh, to to arrest uh, child abuse um, uh, rings and, and there was a, a large scale ring that they um, uh, that, that they disrupted because they were able to sort of trace some of the ways that people had been spending bitcoins and you know just all of these digital fumes that folks use and, and kind of going back to the point around the um, the security of systems although the blockchain systems and and, and others are uh, in theory anonymous from a sort of theoretical perspective uh, they are but it's real people using them and they use multiple accounts in different places etc so so there's a lot of uh, advantages that uh, defenders have as well as this um, as this goes forward, um, you know. And I think that um, uh, Andrea was spot on in terms of the approach that organizations need to take in terms of how you address that overall problem. It is a very large, complex situation for a company, really of any of any size, to to address. And, and you need to have that proper governance lens uh, where the different parts of the organization are looking and. Assessing, you know, assessing their risk and, and making those risk decisions to be able to put the proper protections in place. Well, uh, thank you, Boaz. I think that that kind of gives a, a holistic view of where we are with respect to uh, the, the the situation we face, and and probably we can talk about extend that to uh, kind of Gustavo's your your background and uh, you know going from the cyber world to the physical world of manufacturing supply chain. Um, to educating uh, the leaders, senior leaders who are making decisions to secure those supply chains and systems. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, 
Well, a little bit of my background, uh, uh, because quite frankly, I'm not a, a tech guy. However, I am a tech guy. Uh, but uh, in, uh, in my 40 plus years in the industry, uh, where I've seen the evolution of uh, how uh, vulnerable and how um, interesting the process has been to learn how to protect uh, our assets and uh, I'm talking data as an asset right now. Uh, we, uh, so a little bit about me, uh, 40 plus years in the industry at, at, uh, in consumer goods, the majority of them, uh, uh, um, executive in Procter & Gamble, uh, uh, worked for that company 35 years, for that amazing institution, by the way. And then I did uh, consulting and uh, startup in technology and also a short uh, tenure as a, um, a chief of uh, supply chain officer for Kimberly Clark. Uh, uh, in all these uh, years and experience and now with my startup, I see the industry uh, lacking one of the fundamentals of, of why these things are so critical uh, at this point in time. And it is basically um, education. Uh, I think that, that, that we are not well educated in the, in the management of data, exploiting data, but much less protecting data and, uh, and our systems in general. And as it's been expressed before, the governance structures that are not uh, solid enough are, are a major vulnerability, as well as, 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 as understanding uh, uh, the implications of losing this or that and uh, it becomes really, really a challenge for us. So in this uh, time of my, my uh, trying to do uh, 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 elevate the game on this, on this arena, I, ha I have learned that education becomes the number one priority, but also when you get to education, you know, what you educate people is to think about it strategically more so than really the, the technical aspect of it. And then uh, that you need to really uh, create a strategy that starts with the uh, structure of your, of your uh, data architecture for the operation in a way that, uh, that it makes sense uh, and solutions start being connected to that structure and with that uh, architecture. Um, this is uh, happening repeatedly in every, in every industry. I can, I, I can tell you we are very vulnerable Manufacturing specifically manage a lot of data. We produce a lot of data as much as we produce products to be sold. Uh, we, we, we produce lots and lots of data and, uh, and all that data becomes uh, a, a major vulnerability because we, don't, we are not even using it. So if we're not using all this data, it becomes easy to lose it. It needs to be attacked and uh, et cetera. As well as, as it was mentioned before, the fact that we, uh, we have proliferated in use of technology, digital technology, uh, to a point that uh, becomes uh, a difficult uh, process to interconnect systems with other systems, and every interconnection and transfer of data becomes a major vulnerability. So again, educate our leadership, create the right structure for, for governance, uh, create the right architectural uh, design, for us to anticipate and manage, um, manage vulnerabilities, I understand understand in that context those vulnerabilities, so we can bring solutions along. That would be my my um, point. Well, uh, thank you, Gustavo. I think I, I think if you sum all that up uh, uh, from the 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 triumvirate or trifecta of solutions that we need to connect the leadership. Uh, give them the knowledge and share them the share with them the expertise and have an expert available to support uh, that their informed making informed decision. Uh, the different pro you know issues we have in terms of the digital currency that uh, or the digital economy that has kind of in parallel evolved, and then the physical aspect of this uh, all that uh, you know. Andrea, I'm curious, and you have written on this about existing extensively on the on the governance piece. Um, how do you take decisions um, in, in this physical world, like, you know, manufacturing and other areas um, that you have to take cyber considerations very carefully um, and they can have adverse consequences if you don't, if you're not informed properly? How do you stay informed uh, at the leadership level, senior leadership level? 
I, I mean, I think it goes back again to having the right people in management who are sensitive to these subjects and who will provide not only the tone from the top, but actually the resources and the budget to the experts who are, you know, either managing these teams or on the front lines of doing the work. But I mean, you clearly want to have um, a first class uh, chief information security officer or uh, chief security officer, someone who's really uh, who's responsible for looking at this big, complex package of, of issues that are changing every second. Um, so you want to start with that and you need to have the sensitivity in the management team to understand what your particular footprint, uh, product services, geography, people um, is exposed to. So you need to have that really expert person and team uh, and then give them the, the, the resources and the budget needed. And I, that's always a problem when you don't have a problem. Um, and, you know, the, the difference between resilience and fragility is that fragile organizations think that they don't have problems until they have a problem and then they're not prepared for it. Resilient systems are organizations, companies, uh, nonprofits as well, universities, government agencies that are uh, sensitive to this before it happens or, you know, when, when it's happening, doing all the right things to get the right people the budget that's appropriate, listening to those experts about what kind of technology, IT tools are needed to protect, and then um, also requiring those folks to translate what's going on from a technical standpoint uh, back to management who are not necessarily, you know, IT and technology experts who can then, you know, it, through metrics and dashboards, really understand what's going on and really understand what is needed from a people and resources standpoint, and then can translate that even further up to the board um, where, you know, you have even, I don't mean to be rude, but even more clueless people <laughs> at the board level sometimes who need to be, uh, uh, you know, handheld uh, through these issues. And again, when you're recruiting for new board members, think about recruiting someone with cyber savvy, technology savvy, who is not only there to, to, to sort of think with the board about these issues, but also ask the right questions of the team. Um, and if the management team or the CISO team are kind of mediocre or not prepared or what have you, if you have one or two or three board members who have some of this experience, they can ask the right questions. So it, it's really sort of a continuous improvement cycle at the end of the day where you need at the beginning and at the end, a CEO and a management team that actually is savvy and sensitive to this. No, I'm, I'm, totally totally agree with that. I'm sorry. sorry. Go ahead. I, I'm totally agree with that. Uh, it, it is. And that's why I don't know how uh, uh, I cannot emphasize enough that the education of our leaders is uh, is tremendously important. We will not change the people. We will, we will, we will, we will equip them to, to be successful. And uh, because the majority of them are uh, people my age that didn't grow up on technology, uh, as technology savvy people. And uh, we learn along the way. Uh, many of us learned uh, because of curiosity, but many of us learned because had the incident. And then, and, then, and then you react to it. So it's reactive and not proactive. So creating a, an environment where this becomes more important and even uh, creating a, a, a committee at the, at the board level, which is dedicated to this area, will be very advisable because that will drive uh, the, the, the questions, it will drive the understanding, the penetration, the, the capability will, will increase, and, uh, and, and so on and so uh, Like in everything, the leadership first, and, uh, and uh, everything that happens, positive or negative, is leadership-led uh, uh, and caused. If I could add to that point about the board, um, I think it's a, a best practice, a, a very good practice for boards to be regularly treated to scenario planning, uh, including some of the cyber issues yeah. and some of the technology issues. Boaz mentioned crypto, uh, it's uh, and, and you know blockchain and all these technologies that are penetrating everything and that are very new and potentially damaging, potentially rewarding. And um, we need to get our boards to participate from time to time in uh, uh, crisis uh, preparedness exercises, scenario planning, so that they become more attuned to 
uh, what's going on in the marketplace and, and how, how their governance oversight role really has changed. Yeah. So, you know, that, that brings up uh, probably, you know, uh, the, the, we have a, a clear need and we have a clear, uh, at least understand, basic understanding of where, what we need, right? So maybe you know, go to Boaz and find out where do we get that expertise? Because, you know, our network, especially on the cyber side is relatively small and uh, we need to do a, a lot of work to actually elevate that. So Boaz, uh, uh, how do you balance that versus the professional need versus the industry uh, expectation? And yeah, that, you know, I, I, would, I, I think there's a, a thread that, that ties between Gustavo's point around education and, um, you know, Andrea's point around the, uh, the governance structures and, and bring the board in uh, and, and the resourcing. I think one really critical element and probably the one that's the hardest to, to drive within an organization is the broader buy-in of, let's call it the kind of one, the, the one tier lower of leadership, right? So leaders within the organization who just drive functional areas. If you think of your various engineering teams and your technology teams and your operational teams, um, there's a very close uh, coordination that's needed or involvement of those teams within the cybersecurity program. Um, and that's something that you can't really resource through direct dollars because I mean, you can fund a security team, but then that security team needs to drive change where they're dependent on other teams, you know, uh, building things out, developing, changing their practices. In some cases, it's a, it's a cultural change. Um, and that's something that requires organizational capital more than, you know, uh, uh, financial capital. So there, there's an education process there. Um, there's just a general maturing process. And, and I find that that's the kind of work that's the most critical and takes the most time. Um, and certainly the, uh, the focus from the uh, executive level and from the board is, is critical in creating that um, momentum for something like that to happen. Uh, but there's in some way no substitute for just uh, you know, going through that process of analyzing those risks collectively, prioritizing what are the measures that need to be taken, identifying some of those changes that have to, that have to happen. Um, and I think every organization is going to be a, a different part of that journey. Um, you know, and as, you know, as Gustavo alluded to, you have organizations, for example, in manufacturing, which have very different kind of threat model. They have different kind of data they collect. Uh, you know, in many cases, they have uh, industrial systems, which have, um, you know, may, may have more vulnerabilities and have a different profile. So the way that every organization is going to approach it is, is different. But I think that that coordination effort is, uh, you know, is critical and is, is similar across companies. Hey, Val, if I could just jump in, because I think a way to put teeth into what Boaz just said in an organization is to tie some of those moves that you need to take to performance metrics, individual team, organizational performance metrics. Um, when I was a general counsel at a company that was an international electric power company, uh, we had environmental health and safety issues that were very challenging around the world. And our board of directors and, and senior management team uh, tied my bonus and that of the team that I was supervising, the environmental health and safety team, to actual measurable improvements in health and safety and environmental uh, um, measurements uh, to our bonus every year. And it made a difference. <laughs> um, and so I think tying a lot of uh, what we're talking about here from a cybersecurity um, you know, the cyber hygiene and education pieces that Gustavo was talking about, tying those to, to actionable metrics that affect your bonus and your compensation, uh, all the way up to the top, by the way, <laughs> including this, yeah. the CEO, uh, is not a bad idea if, if, you, if, it's, if it's, you know, if it makes sense for the organization. Yeah. Uh, beautiful. This is a, an example of people understanding the importance of it and even if they don't understand how to manage the risk of safety that you were dealing with, they understood the importance of it to the point that they are tied to the bonus. Uh, so, yeah, those are, those are uh, 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 solutions no? that, or ideas. Uh, the ultimate will be that we understand it to the point that we create strategies, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, but in absence of that and managing the risk, uh, we, we become an imperative before even understanding is that you will not understand the technology uh, 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 deep down uh, necessarily, but you need to understand it's important enough for you to do stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, so, Boaz, how do you tie, tie that? I mean, uh, you know, typically 
the cyber functions typically happen under IT, and they are driven by technical metrics as not as much as the the, the financial or the risk metrics that now we are realizing it needs to right. So your your thoughts on how do we tie those two expectations together? Uh, for sure. So you know, first I, I uh, I'm always wary of quantitative metrics when they uh, when they don't tell a real story, uh, and so I, I think that. When you look at um, cyber risk and how you present that really at the higher level, while there's some places where metrics play a supporting role in terms of building out a narrative, I think the story is fundamentally qualitative in terms of how are our capabilities in different places? How are we doing? Where do we need to, where do we need to mature? Um, you know, I found sometimes that metrics can sort of skew people in a certain direction, uh, and, and then you have misaligned incentives in terms of what you're looking to do. On the other hand, of course, there is a um, there's a critical role for metrics in terms of drive accountability on specific projects and, and seeing how things are, are going forward. Um, from the perspective of how you actually drive forward that level, of, uh, that level of collaboration, I think that having a clear risk view, a cyber risk view, where the organization has mapped out what it considers to be uh, you know, the issues it's the most concerned about, and then maps that to its initiatives and product projects that it has, and then identifies those gaps is a critical exercise for any uh, for any security team and for any risk team. Because then you're able to look and say, you know, these are the risks that are the, we're, we're the most concerned about. We're going to address these ones in the coming you know four quarters because of uh, the kind of opportunity, the, the the amount of effort it's going to take, and so forth. These are the ones that we're knowingly putting out, and we'll look to put various mitigations in place in the meantime. But Having that kind of focus is, is really critical, and it, it takes time to get there. But if a company is not there yet, it's a, it's a non-trivial exercise, um, and you need to also make sure that you're doing it at the appropriate level so that you're able to have those meaningful conversations. Sure, and I think the metrics, uh, you know, as much as we understand financial metrics, cyber metrics are still yet to be realized and connected from a quantitative cyber operations uh, uh, metrics to the actual business impact that it gets until you have, say, you know, a ransomware situation, don't know. And I think that's where, Andrea, you mentioned about having the, the preparedness, the tabletop exercises, getting through live fire drill situations becomes more and more important. Uh, well, we have five just, more minutes. Uh, maybe, you know, one, some thoughts. One quick, one quick comment. I totally agree with Boaz's comments about the qualitative and quantitative. And I think there are qualitative, let's not call them metrics, but... but me, um, uh, things that you can require um, that go to the resilience piece and the risk management piece. Um, if you don't have certain things in place, that's that's a, the, a minus. If you have certain things that are working in place, that's a plus. So you can um, create incentives without it being quantitative, uh, especially in this area. And the Securities and Exchange Commission here in the United States um, is actually demanding some of those things in a proposal that they've done for for cybersecurity disclosure having to do with governance risk oversight etc um so i totally agree with boaz's point well uh, and i think it's it's important that we, we have a starting point right especially in business you have objectives and key, key results and and those objectives are, are now clear for in terms of protecting the enterprise protecting the data around the enterprise uh, what key results should we seek at the outset to make sure that those objectives are met? Um, now, turning to uh, kind of uh, Gustavo, uh, you know, so we started the discussion around uh, awareness and uh, also the importance of data and not not knowing or understanding the real implication. Uh, turning the topic, uh, turning towards the core topic about minimizing cybercrime. Uh, what are your thoughts from as a business person? That you really want to protect and and uh, uh, knowing that what you know you know especially in the manufacturing space and the data that that uh, typically those businesses are like um I'm, I'm not sure i got the the, the yes well, what, what, I mean, what are crown jewels that people should start even thinking because i think you know again just like a framework you also need to think about where to start from um, yeah uh, i i would say that the, the most important thing is that uh, the, the same things that we worry about when it comes to competitive advantage, like our formulas and our processes and our, you know settings, uh, like our commercial data and strategies, 
uh, 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 those become imperative for people to protect, and we do whatever to protect those. Uh, it's more difficult to see uh, the vulnerability that is created with data and, that, and the use of data that can be exploited in a way that can go all the way to understand these things that we protect so much, the formulas, the commercial data, the strategies. So apply your knowledge of what you're protecting now as your key assets into, into protecting what you are collecting, right? Correct. I think the, intu the intuition will go directly to protect the things that are critical for competitive advantage in the business. But then we need to make a connection between that and the data that we, that we manage daily. Uh, because that's what brings, the correlations what brings the vulnerability and the transition between data systems from one system to the other. We have plenty of that. There are companies that only do uh, data integration. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, uh, so, so because we are uh, uh, generating data uh, all over the place and uh, we are now need to have one more party in the game, in the ecosystem of production system to interpret and uh, correlate and connect that data. That, that is every touch of those is a vulnerability. And uh, we need to understand in our, in, our, in our system, in every company, individual entity, what are the points of, uh, of contact that, are, that become more um, uh, worrisome for the given business situation, the business industry. That would be my, my first approach. I, that's what I would recommend, I recommend to, to people. Now there is a, there are today uh, assessment tools for uh, for these type of things. Uh, I don't believe there are uh, all of uh, all of all of them are good enough. Uh, many of them are people because when when people don't know enough about this area, if you know a little, you become a genius in this in this area. And the truth of the matter that that they're, they're not really geniuses there. But there are there are ways to to assess in a technical way. Um, uh, there are uh, a structure for uh, assess assessment that uh, consider uh, 10 dimensions of, of uh, Industry 4.0 yeah, in uh, four operations specifically. Yeah. And those, so, one of the dimensions is cyber security or cyber uh, data management and protection. Yeah. And, uh, uh, that dimension specializes in understanding technologies that will help companies to protect the data and yeah. protect the management of the data, et cetera, et cetera and recommend to people uh, solutions to cope with this vulnerability. Yeah. The same thing that we have, the same dimension for other areas that like sustainability. So in the interest uh, of time, Gustavo, sorry to interrupt, but uh, oh, let me get some last words from, from our friends here. Uh, the Boaz, you, you have seen across the different sectors. So your, your takeaways from this, uh, from this session in 60 seconds or less now. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I think really the, the key element for any organization looking at uh, how to either start a program or move a program forward uh, is around threat modeling. L look at what you're most concerned about and how well positioned you are to, to mitigate those risks. And, and from there, you know, drive your strategy and your and your plans. And Andrea, maybe the last word because this session kicks us out. <laughs> so uh, I think uh, governance, resilience, focus on cyber and competence focus and interdisciplinary collaboration focus. I think governance has to look over those three things, um, risk, resilience, and competence. Absolutely. Well, uh, uh, thank you for uh, sharing all these great thoughts. I, I think this, this conversation can continue on. Uh, we have a couple of questions uh, from the audience. We'll probably have to do that offline. Uh, but one is very curious question about why the decline in ransomware attacks after Ukraine war began. So that is something that we are all pondering. There are different theories about that. So I'll leave it there. But uh, for responding to ransomware attacks, there is there's several plans and outlines out there. Um, you know, maybe follow up uh, in the Horasis community of, uh, uh, of, of cyber leaders as well as online. Uh, and I'll, I'll find, I'll try to find Frank and find our, our participants here and, and get some resources out. Uh, but uh, collectively, I think we are uh, we are aligned the fact of that that governance with technical expertise and that awareness. Those three things together have to come towards protecting. We are still in a very defensive uh, situation uh, when it comes to uh, cybersecurity and the and the challenges that we are dealing with. And eventually, I think we'll get to a situ we'll get to a place a better place where we feel good about our defenses and we, we are able to take actions that are proactive and protective and then shift that whole security 
thinking and and uh, this risk by you know uh, design with risk in mind uh, towards the left uh, while determining processes while running our businesses and making sure that we don't give cyber criminals a chance uh, and we protect our assets as much as we protect our physical assets so uh, thank you very much and uh, it was a pleasure being together again and hopefully we'll do this again and in the next forum the conversation continues progresses towards it so thank you we'll stop thank you very much